Uh, I'd like to uh, begin by saying how honored I am to be here. I really enjoy coming to um, Southeastern. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place, there's wonderful people. Um, I had the pleasure of having some Southeastern doctoral students come stay with me last year with Christy and Anna, and we had such a gr good time. Uh, they attended a, a conference on women in academia. Uh, I get treated so wonderfully when I come here. Some great things are happening here, and I love Wake Forest. I think this is definitely one of the best parts of America. I love the little um, street down there. Well, they now have a, a, a comic book shop. I don't know whether you know this. They now have a comic book shop. So this, this is stuff. So you've got everything for Bible nerds and real nerds. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm really delighted to be here and to share with you. And I, and I thought I would talk about something that I've been working on, uh, and that's Paul's letter to the Philippians. I was able to work through this fairly concertedly when I wrote the New Testament introduction uh, with my good friend Tom Wright, uh, but also when I, I cooperated with another friend of mine, Nijay Gupta, who's at, uh, I believe, Portland Seminary. We've written a Philippians commentary together. And for me, this is the first time I've, I've, I've really worked through Philippians. You know, I've mentioned part of it here and there. I've preached on different pa uh, parts of it. But this was the first time I did the slow grind of writing a, a commentary on the, you know, word by word, phrase by phrase, passage by passage. And uh, I, really, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about uh, the Apostle Paul. I learned a lot about Christ, about faith, ministry, and myself. And so I just want to share with you a, a few highlights of that journey going through Philippians. Uh, to begin with, I'd say that Paul's epistle to the Philippians uh, overflows with effervescent joy. It sparkles with the delight of family uh, affections. Uh, this is a letter that's designed to be encouraging and refreshing, uh, and reminding readers uh, of the magnificence of the Christ of who they serve and, and their great joy in Christ. And it shows as well Paul being very joyful even in the midst of adversity. It's a mature and measured piece of writing where Paul really wants to display his gratitude for the Philippians. I mean, normally when we get in Paul's letters, we normally find him dealing with the problem child congregations, like Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, I think it's E.P. Sanders says, you, sh you should imagine Paul, when he's, when he's dictating the letter to the Galatians, imagine him pacing and yelling. Okay, whereas when in the Corinthian letters, you can also imagine him sitting down, uh, almost weeping as he writes this letter. Uh, but when he thinks of the Philippians, he's filled with like, oh, you know, a, 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 uh, thank you for just not being a problem. Okay, I mean, there's certain issues he's got to deal with in the congregation to help them out, certain warnings and certain reconciliations, but this is, this is not a problem child congregation. Uh, and uh, Paul is very thankful in particular for the financial aid that they've provided him and the services uh, that he's got from Epaphroditus. But beyond those sort of situational elements, uh, this is a letter that is only four chapters, but it's rich in, in theological themes. I mean, you've got the famous Christ poem of chapter 2 with the story of the incarnation, Christ's humiliation and, exal and exaltation, which becomes paradigmatic for people's behavior. And Paul's letter to the Philippians also emphasizes several things that readers should be attentive to. That authentic fellowship involves generous finances. Christian joy makes it possible to endure horrendous hardship. The humility of Christ is our model for living. And when it comes to false teachings, to be forewarned is to be forearmed, which is why we all hold fast to the word of life. Never give up in prayer and never be stingy in thanksgiving. And above all, be citizens of heaven who advance the cause of the gospel of earth. I mean, in sum, it's a letter about how to shine for Christ in a city of pagan darkness. That's basically what I, I took from reading and studying Paul's letter to the Philippians. One of the big debates, though, has been around where was Paul when he wrote this letter? The traditional answer has been that Paul wrote it from Rome. And this is one of the captivity epistles where he also wrote to uh, Philemon, to the Colossians, 
and to the Ephesians. And a few people have put out minority reports that maybe it was from Caesarea or Ephesus. Uh, I am of the mind, and, and so is, is um, N.T. Wright, that I'm, I'm very confident this letter was written from Ephesus. And I, I think there's a number of good considerations that would suggest that. First of all, we know that Paul spent considerable periods of time in Ephesus. And an Ephesian imprisonment or some sort of um, very serious moment in Paul's career seems to be alluded to both in Acts and by Paul's remarks in 2 Corinthians where he talks about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia, how I fought wild beasts in Asia. These could be very much metaphors for, for Paul facing a capital trial of some kind. The other thing to know is that Paul's travel plans cannot really be squared with Philippians being written from Rome, or certainly all of the captivity letters for that mind. Uh, If Paul was planning to leave Rome, his next stop was going to be somewhere like Spain. And yet he writes to Philemon saying, I'm hoping to stop off your way and drop in and say hello. It's very unlikely Paul was planning to go from Rome to Spain via the interior of Asia Minor. And then you've got all the various comings and goings of of Epaphras, Epaphroditus, You've got uh, the runaway slave or the absconded slave, Onesimus, all the collections and people getting information about Paul. Makes a lot more sense if Paul is being imprisoned in Ephesus and that way the, uh, the, uh, the letter writing to Colossae, to Philippi, just across the Aegean, makes a lot more sense. Uh, in addition, uh, thirdly, Paul's polemical remarks about uh, Judaism and about the Jewish proselytizers in chapter 3 gives us the impression that the events in Antioch and in Galatia are still a bit more fresh in his mind. Paul's uh, polemics, his his rhetoric, you you get get the feeling that this wound is still very raw. So the, the debates he's had are fairly recent, not 10 years later, when he's uh, now uh, ensconced in Rome in imprisonment. Now, when I, when I put this to my students, they often uh, point back and say, yes, but Paul talks about the Praetorian. You know, the whole Praetorian guard knows while he's in prison and how uh, he's made relations with all of the family of Caesar's household. Surely that means Paul has to be in Rome. Uh, The issue is, what does the word Praetorian uh, mean in this context? Now, the Praetorian can refer to the Praetorian guard, the people, or it can refer to the Praetorian barracks in Rome. But let's say Paul is in Rome and he's talking about the local Praetorian guard there or or the barracks. Uh, Roman emperors did not put common criminals in the Praetorian barracks. This was a high security facility for people who are thought to be enemies of the state. So if there was a senator who was accused of plotting against the emperor, uh, someone like that could be uh, incarcerated or uh, be put in the custody of the Praetorian Guard in the Praetorian barracks. Uh, Common criminals, religious enthusiasts from the east were not given that kind of five-star treatment. The other thing is the word Praetorian can simply mean an imperial building. Uh, we find that in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus is led to the Praetorium. Okay? And in other places around the empire, uh, Praetorian seems to have been used to describe the local government building. This is where you would find everything from uh, governors to bean counters, people collecting taxes, or people just assigned to look after the emperor's affairs. In Ephesus, there was a senatorial governor but there's also two procurators who are there to look after the emperor's own personal interests in the city. It's likely that Paul was being kept in some imperial building, some administrative building, while the events of his life were being investigated. But what about the family of Caesar? Again, I don't think it's likely that Nero was introducing his personal relatives to uh, some uh, person who was being accused of stirring up trouble in Rome. And that's even the more likely when we learn that the uh, Familia Caesarea, or Caesareus, can't remember the exact Latin term, 
was a technical term to describe the imperial public service. So slaves and freemen who were part of the uh, emperor's retinue or his administrative arm. I think of people who were like scribes, people who deliver messengers, uh, people who keep accounts and and, uh, taxes, those sorts of people. That was called the the, the imperial bureaucracy or if you like the the federal government, for, for a better word, was called the family of Caesar or the family of the emperor. So I think it makes a lot more sense to see this letter written much earlier in Paul's career from the location in Ephesus. Now the situation that seems to be going on is that Paul has had his ministry in Ephesus. He seems to have got into a bit of trouble there. Uh, we, we read about some of the events that happened in Ephesus during Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. And Paul is also a little bit worried that some uh, Jewish Christian um, well, I'll call them proselytizers, similar to what he's experienced in Antioch or Galatia, may turn up and may tell his Philippian uh, converts that you can't be a follower of Jesus unless you first con- uh, convert to Judaism in some form or another. Uh, and Paul very much is worried that that could arrive, if not already arrive, in Philippi as these people will be following him. He also wants to intercede a little bit for two uh, sisters who are not getting on, Euodia and Syntyche. But Paul's principal aim is to really thank the Philippians for the support that they've provided him materially and personally. So that that seems to be the situation behind in the letter. I want to just give you now a, a few highlights of things I've learned and picked up at key passages in the letter. Uh, One place to start is Paul's opening greetings where he refers to bishops and deacons. Uh, Now this is the only time Paul actually refers to official office holders in the letters. He he normally doesn't mention people holding a particular office. Uh, He very rarely even mentions people who are in charge. I mean in the Corinthian letters you get references to Chloe's people and the household of Stephanus, but Paul normally doesn't tell us what's going on behind the scenes in terms of leadership structure, which is a little bit frustrating because we want to know what is the prescribed specific um, kind of, you know, uh, hierarchy or ecclesiology that's going on. Uh, There has been considerable debate concerning the identity of the uh, the episcopoi, the the overseers, or as we call them in uh, some context, bishops. One scholar, um, uh, Alistair Stewart, has got a very intriguing suggestion about how uh, elders and uh, overseers may relate to each other. He argues they're not synonyms, they're more like perionyms. Let, Let me explain that. So each congregation would have a leader who was their overseer, you know, their episkopos. But when all of the episkopoi get together, they become a federation of elders or, or presbyteroi. And you, you, you seem, you seem to, to get this um, in something like Acts 20, where Paul t- gathers together all of the, of the elders and tells them to be episkopoi of their respective churches. So it's a very interesting. So each church would have its own episkopos, but when they come together, they may well function as, as a federated body of presbytori, which would mean that each congregation was Anglican, but when they got together, they became Presbyterian, uh, which would be one funny way of putting it. Um, I find that a very interesting and intriguing proposal, although I should say Ben Merkel has a very nice review of Stuart's book over at, is that the Gospel Coalition? Nine marks. So you can uh, you can check out um, Professor Merkel's view on uh, that. Um, I think you'll find he's less inclined to accept Stuart's proposal uh, than I am. But that's something, just something worth noting. That's just putting that view out there. I'm just saying it's a very interesting proposal. Now, of course, you can't talk about Philippians, okay, without talking about the famous the Christ poem or the Christ hymn. It's like going to see the musical Evita without listening to someone sing Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. It's like, it's like going to... Oh, actually, Anna, 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 one of the PhD students, loves musical theatre. She'll get that reference. Um, it's like going to North Carolina and not, traveling, uh, not trying the North Carolina barbecue with the peculiar vinaigrette coleslaw, um, which I've learned to love. So we have to talk about Philippians 2. And, it, and this is you know, one of the most magnificent pieces of 
of Christian prose, of Christology, and it's amazing that within 20 years of Jesus' death, Jesus is being identified as being pre-existent, equal to God, and exalted to the highest place, which certainly proves that some of the um, highest Christology was also the earliest. And as Martin Hengel said, some of the biggest moves or inferences about Christology more happened in the first 20 years than would happen in the next two or 300. And because this is such an important piece of literature for Christian faith, worship, ethics and Christ devotion, uh, devotion, you can imagine that a lot of it is contested. When one thing is contested is the very genre of what we're dealing with. Uh, is this the hymn, a Christ hymn as it's called, or is it more likely just a piece of extended prose? Uh, one of my good friends, Ben Edsel, uh, who actually attends a church with me uh, in, in Australia, he's a research fellow at the Australian Catholic University. Him and Jennifer Strawbridge, I think, have written a very good article arguing uh, this is not technically a hymn, it's more likely a piece of extended prose. So this, this, this is more of a poetic language rather than necessarily an early, an early hymn. And I think a, a number of scholars would uh, agree with him. One of the debates that's also taking place is not whether Paul or, or this, this poem regards Jesus as divine, but in what particular sense Jesus is identified as divine. One of the more recent trends is to say that divinity is something more like a spectrum and there are gradations of divinity. And so in what sense is that Jesus, is he divine? And people get cues from this when there's references to some Roman emperor saving a city from civil war or famine or foreign invasion and the leaders of the city then make a proclamation that we will offer divine honours to the Roman emperor. And if there is anything else that he's done for us, we will give him even more divine honours. We'll give him, you know, not just a temple, but we'll even make regular annual sacrifices. We'll create a priesthood. So this is the idea that being divine is not so much about uh, one's being or one's um, essence, but it's more about one's accomplishments and merely the reciprocal, um, reciprocal relation, the reciprocal um, gratitude that you demonstrate in pouring divine honours on them. Now you can imagine what some people do this when it comes to the study of early Christology. They argue in effect that Jesus is basically being identified as a human being who is, who is being deified and who is being given divine honours uh, as a result of his you know, redemptive mission or something like that. I understand where that's coming from, but I'm becoming more and more convinced that in the ancient world they did have something of an ontology of divinity. And I first came across this when I was reading Plutarch, when he refers to two different species of divinity. He says there are some, there are some divine beings who are immortals, so, you know, Roman emperors or, or heroes from antiquity who get deified like, uh, like Hercules or Heracles, who was kind of taken up into heaven and, and deified. But then he says another species of gods are those which are unbegotten. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is the Nicene language, but it doesn't come from Nicaea. This is their concept of div divinity in the ancient world. There are some people that are eternally and ontologically, simply by nature, uh, divine. The question is, when people like the Apostle Paul ascribe divine qualities and properties to Jesus, do they meet it in this honorific sense of one who's achieved great things and uh, come to divine status, or do they mean that in the sense of being a divine being with, a, uh, with an eternal, inherent, intrinsic divine nature? I think some of the language that Paul uses where he talks about being in the form of God, being equality with God, that points to Paul thinking in ontological coordinates, not merely in gradations of honour of which divinity is but the climax. So that's something I'm hoping to explore in a future book project. Another thing that's being very prominent in the discussion of this hymn is uh, the, how the lordship of Christ relates to the lordship of the Roman emperor. Uh, so who is the real, who is the real kurios uh, 
of the world. Who is the Lord of the world? Is it the Sebastos, the venerable one, the Roman Empire, the son of the divine Julius, or is it the son of David, the Christos, Israel's Messiah? Uh, so so my, my um, good colleague, Tom Wright, he's very, he's very keen to say that when you say Jesus is Lord, it means that Caesar is not so devotion to Jesus is, is intimately and intensely counter-imperial. It's a subversive act of political resistance to say that Jesus is Lord. It's like being in a 1930s party in, uh, uh, in Germany and saying Jesus is the true Führer, something along those lines. It's a, it's a com- competitive claim. Uh, However, the counter-imperial nature of Christian language for Jesus' lordship is disputed. Some don't see it as being counter-imperial at all. And some people point out, well, the language for Jesus' lord, it's not imitating or or parroting the imperial cult with the worship of the emperor. It's simply straight out of the Septuagint. It's simply using the the, the language from the Greek Bible that that many people in the early church used. Uh, In fact, Paul was not really a political activist. I mean, he wasn't running around the eastern Mediterranean you know, tweeting hashtag slave lives matter or, or, you know, or free Palestine now or anything like that. The ratio of references to Jesus to Caesar or God, Theos to Kaiser is 30 to 1. And if you look at Romans 13, he seems to take a fairly positive view of government, of, uh, of, of human institutions, which are there appointed by God to do things like uh, to carry out capital punishment. Uh, the other thing to say, and, and, and this, this is a bit of a truism, um, there is always a spike in the anti-imperial readings of Paul whenever there's a Republican in the White House. Uh, it's true. Now, now I'm, I was, as soon as Trump got elected, I thought, I bet you next year at SBL, some Paul section is going to devote something all to empire. Okay, so when when there's a Republican in the White House, everyone gets positively, you know, Paul the anti-empire, and by empire they really mean the American Empire or the Republican Empire. But when there's a Democrat in the in the White House, they all get positively Niburian. Oh well, you know, church and state, we can work together for the common good, that type of a thing. Uh, so you have to wonder whether the whole anti-imperial Paul uh, is really more about uh, American foreign policy, American politics when there's a Republican in office. Um, so we could be a little bit sceptical about, uh, about the anti-imperial Paul. But I actually think there are some very, very good reasons for thinking that Paul does have a, a counter-imperial slant to his theology and that when Paul does call uh, Jesus Lord, he doesn't mean it in a strictly religious sense or he's Lord of my heart, uh, but he means it in a far more public, cosmic, and political sense. First of all, uh, Israel's uh, religion, its the, the theology, the devotion, was always counter-imperial. Uh, Yahweh is against the gods of Babylon, Assyria, Persia, because there's a link between the potentate, the king, and the pantheon, of the pagan nations, okay? So the Assyrians with their gods and their kings are kind of like one package. In the same way in which Yahweh is against the kings and the gods of the Syrians and the Babylonians, uh, Yahweh is also against, in a sense, the gods of the Romans, the Greeks, uh, the Seleucids, or or whoever it is. So that there is a kind of counter-imperial nature simply part of the DNA of Israel's ancestral religion. Now, coming to Romans 13, uh, we have to remember, that yes, this does talk about obedience to governing authorities, and we can ask the question, would Paul have written what he did if he knew what Nero was going to get up to? Uh, Paul wrote this during Nero's good years, the first half of the reign, his reign, when he was very... Um, uh, fairly well-mannered and good-tempered, listening to good people. And then when he goes a little bit, you know, totes cray-cray, uh, things change a bit. I wonder if, if, Paul, if would Paul have written what he did here if he knew what, was, what Nero was going to do to Christians in years to come. But even then, Paul still recognises that Rome, government, uh, 
the imperial apparatus is an authority that is appointed by God. That's why Paul keeps emphasizing in Romans 13, these people have appointed by God. They have been uh, charged to do a service by God, that type of thing. So in one sense, there is a counter-imperial element here because Rome has power and authority and a service as appointed by the God of Israel. So in other words, it's the God of Israel of whom the Roman Empire and its emperor is but a servant. I'm pretty sure the emperor and the high priest in the imperial cult did not think of themselves as a servant to the God of Israel. Uh, If you read the literature, they believed the gods had decreed that the toga-wearing Romans were meant to be masters of the universe. Uh, This is the kind of rhetoric they appeal. So there is a counter-imperial element that is going on there. For me, the real smoking gun for this is where you get to Romans 15, 12, where Paul brings in a quote from Isaiah about one from the root of Jesse who will rise and rule over the nations. Um, Because that was what Caesar was currently doing at the moment. He was the one who had risen up and was ruling over the nations. And Paul says pretty explicitly, that role belongs to Israel's son of David. Um, uh, So I, I think that's very clear. And then we get into the reception history of Paul, where you get into Acts, or the Acts of the Paul. And second century Christian literature is very emphatic that devotion to Caesar means a certain degree of resistance against empire. Now, we have to pass that out a little bit. Some church fathers like Tertullian say, look, we pray for the empire. We want the best from the empire. We're just not prepared to worship it in a way that compromises our worship of Jesus. So there was an attempt in various ways to negotiate living with the Roman Empire. We can offer some tokens of of obedience and allegiance, but there comes a point where we're willing to pray for the state, but we're not willing to worship it. But for the most part, certainly during periods of persecution, Christians highlighted the anti-imperial nature of their faith. Uh, One of the questions I love assigning to students is, would the Apostle Paul rather be Nero's chaplain or Nero's assassin? Uh, If Paul had to choose between being Nero's chaplain and Nero's assassin, which would it be? Uh, I think we could say that for Paul, um, he wasn't planning on leading a mob up the Palatine Hill um, yelling Six Semper Tyrannus, which I'm sure you all know is the motto of the state of Virginia, which means, you know, give it to the tyrant. Uh, but neither was Paul, would Paul be comfortable singing Laudes Imperi, um, you know, all hail the empire. So I think there is definitely something to the counter-imperial Paul, um, but it certainly needs to be nuanced or defined uh, uh, with several qualifications. Uh, Moving along, because that's a bit on on the the Christ hymn, uh, another uh, important passage in Philippians is is chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. I mean, this letter really takes an intriguing, uh, intriguing, should be using this, takes an intriguing turn. After the exhortations about humility and community, uh, Paul really levels, uh, gets into a level of of, uh, theological polemics um, that's remarkably, uh, remarkably intense. Um, He talks about, you know, certain people, you know, those those dogs, those mutilators of the flesh. I mean, you know, uh, dem dare be fighting words. Um, Paul, Paul is really trying to say something. I think what Paul is saying is that the sign of belonging to God is not the standard Jewish measures of circumcision, cultus, and confidence, and confidence in Israel's forthcoming triumph over the pagans. Instead, the currency of covenantal belonging is true obedience. That's the real circumcision. It's being a spirit person, you know, worshipped by the spirit and boasting not in your own deeds, but the Messiah's deeds, which is why he has no confidence in the flesh. Uh, And Paul can really look back on his former way of life in Judaism um, from the vantage point of faith, seeing it through a Messiah-shaped perspective and he says trying to attain dikaiosune that way uh, it's a dead end it's a false confidence it's a stumbling block in in comparison to Christ uh, they are practically uh, worthless now how you understand these remarks in light of Paul's 
somewhat sectarian debates with other Jewish Christians and then how you discuss them in, uh, in light of uh, modern debates or you know, sort of uh, interfaith ecumenical conversations with Jews um, is, 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 I think, is uh, slightly two different things. Um, uh, I mean, and we, we do have to talk about Paul and the Jews in very responsible ways. I mean, I can give you um, two very good reasons. Uh, one of the uh, prime ministerial candidates in the British Labor Party, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, has been explicitly, I think quite nakedly, anti-Semitic in some of the previous remarks he's made uh, about, about the Jewish people and particularly about Israel. Um, I, he, I, I get the feeling he's trying to reach out to a somewhat extreme Muslim constituency and throughout his career he's made some statements about Israel and the Jews that are very concerning. And just yesterday I was listening to some sort of strange news channel where someone was talking about a Jew coup to get uh, Donald Trump impeached. Uh, this is very, very concerning language. So when we wrestle with a text like Philippians 3, we have to realise this is, this is um, in-house sectarian language between two different Jews, between some who are still trying to, to lay hold on and stress the normativity of Israel's ancestral religion and customs, even as it pertains to Gentiles. And then you have the Apostle Paul who sees in the coming of Christ, not the nullification, not the renunciation of everything that's, that's gone before, but God has gen done a genuinely new thing. And the standard indices of righteousness, the standard ways of calculating worth, the standard measures of who's in and who's out have been completely redefined by the coming of Christ and the giving of the Spirit. But I wouldn't be using that polemical language and leading with it uh, in discussions with your local rabbi. I would not start out by calling him a dog, a mutilator of, of the flesh, uh, that type of thing. This is, this is, this is it's anything sort of intra-Christian um, debating about how Gentiles be the people of God in the context of the new covenant. Um, okay, I'm heading off for time. Uh, look, there are so many key themes we could discuss in this letter. Uh, let, me, let me just touch on a few of them. Um, obviously, the, the, the gospel looms large. I would say that Philippians is perhaps the most densely evangelical letter of Paul. Paul uses the word evangelion, gospel, I think more uh, than any other letter, or certainly in terms of its like ratio, it, it's there. It's all about the advance of the gospel, living a life worthy of the gospel, being in chains for the gospel, that type of thing. Paul also has a lot to say about the theme of koinonia and fellowship. And we have to remember fellowship is not simply a Christian version of, of friendship. Like, you know, we'll have, you know, to stay on after church for some fellowship where we'll, you know, we'll have a, a, a bicky, I mean, sorry, a cookie. We'll have a cookie and some coffee and that's fellowship. No, uh, a fellowship is what you do with missionaries you're supporting. When you financially support people in mission and ministry, that seems to be the type of koinonia that Paul is talking about, how you, you, you invest in them and they in turn uh, entrust and invest themselves in you. That's real fellowship means it's the finances you give to support mission and ministry. Uh, this is also a letter that is rich in thanksgiving. Um, uh, Paul says constantly, particularly get to chapter four, he is really thankful uh, for the fact that these people are not a problem child congregation and they've been such a blessing to him when he's been at some of the lowest points. So when he's hit rock bottom, they've been the ones that he's counted on. Paul also has a fair bit to say about the renunciation of privileges. Um, now, if you think about it, this, this is quite a, a topical um, Topical topic, it's a bit of a tautology. Um, but it's, it's quite relevant because the issue of certain cultural privileges, you know, white privilege and all sorts of things, uh, th this is something that's got a lot of currency in cultural discussions both in America and certainly in Australia. And Paul definitely does stress um, the renunciation of privileges. He uses Christ as the best example. He says, look, Christ had the privileges of divine glory, being in the form of God. Now, he didn't renounce it, like I renounce my Godness, but he divests himself of those privileges, those advantages, uh, so he can engage in his task of redemptive suffering. 
Paul uses himself. He says, look, if you want to talk about righteousness, I have all the privileges. And he lists them. You know, I was a, I was a Hebrew from Hebrew parents. You know, uh, as for zeal, persecuting the church, I was the Pharisee. You know, I, I got the best marks in Hebrew school, but I renounce all those privileges because they count for naught. And there is a sense in which Paul wants the Philippians to do the same. Uh, to renounce what it, you know, maybe it's their Roman privileges, the advantages they have, so they're no longer trusting or defining themselves by their Roman identity, but rather by a Christ-centered identity, um, and and that's one of the things we, we have to we have to consider for ourselves and what that means in our context. What what privileges do we have to um, maybe not renounce, uh, but, but but put aside so we we can do other things. Finally, one big uh, th- theme that struck me in Philippians, and, and this, this, this is probably the number one takeaway I got, was the importance of the theme of imitation. Imitation really looms large in the letter. I think one of the purposes of the Christ poem is not merely to give us this majestic, this extended narrative uh, of Christology, of Christ in equality with God, um, taking on human form, uh, being uh, humiliated, um, his death and then his exaltation. It's also to give us uh, an example. This this, this is the quintessential example of humility. And in the ancient world, humility was not a virtue. Humility was for slaves. Humility was for inferiors. You will not find philosophers talking about the virtue of humility for the most part. Uh, yeah, maybe bragging a little bit too much uh, may not be good. That will get a lot of people upset. But generally speaking, you are not people accentuating the virtue of humilitas. That seems to be a, a distinctly Christian contribution to the virtuous life. And yet Paul says that is what we are to imitate, have the same mind, the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Paul considers himself a, an explicit example. He says, you know, he says imitate me. He wants people to uh, imitate uh, Timothy and Epaphroditus. And I went through Paul's letters and it, it, is, it is quite astounding how common this theme of imitation is. I've, one of my PhD students, Jason Hood, has written a good little book on this as well called The Imitation of God. And I'll never forget the time he was sitting in my lounge room and he asked me a question that someone asked him. And the question is, what is the one thing that Paul says he has taught in all the churches? Now, as I went through my mental filing system, I thought about things like, well, you know, justification by faith, um, maybe something about Psalm 110, about Christ, the glory of Christ. But he pointed me to 1 Corinthians 4.17, uh, where Paul talks about the things he has taught in everywhere in every church, which is, my way of life in Christ. Uh, The number one thing that Paul says he has taught in all the churches is my way of life in Christ. Uh, Imitation is one of the most important things uh, that Christian leaders should embody and signify. Uh, we, We need to find people who are worthy of imitation and imitate them. But the good thing is we, we do it by nature. We are by nature mimetic Creatures, we imitate what we admire. I, I find if I've been listening to a lot of Don Carson sermons, I start spe- preaching with a French Canadian accent. I start talking about how Jesus was out in a boot and is built in Galilee, or something like that. Or when I, when I, if I listen to, if I watch too many NT Wright videos on YouTube, I keep using the word precisely. It's precisely that kind of kingdom vision. It's precisely what Jesus is trying to get. And it's precisely, because we, we imitate what we admire. We, we do it I- intuitively. Um, I, I, I saw this in, in, in a, at home with the interaction between um, my son Marcus when he was very, very little and my wife Naomi. When, when my wife Naomi is being a little bit stressed uh, by our children when they're, when they're making somewhat unrealistic demands of her uh, at inappropriate times, she'll say, well, that's just too bad. You're going to have to wait. So that's a phrase. She says, it's too bad. And I'll never forget the one day uh, Naomi said to Marcus, Marcus, it's time to get in the car. And Marcus turned around and said, too bad. Because uh, he was under the understanding when someone wants you to do something that you don't want to do, you say the word 
too bad and you don't have to do it. Uh, what Marcus did not understand is what I call the asymmetrical power relationship he has with his mother. <laughs> that it, it, it only works one way. <laughs> there is the chain of command, mum at the top and you at the bottom. End of chain. I mean, that, that's it. But, but we, we, by nature, we, we imitate things, uh, don't we? Um, I, 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 who's, who's here ever heard of Jordan Peterson? Anyone heard of Jordan Peterson? Um, he was this famous Canadian psychologist who's um, kind of, you know, very anti-politically um, correctness and, you know, a bit of kind of like, you know, a bit of a, you've got a bit like what I call a bit of a man-up princess kind of um, mentality. And it's funny because it's true. Um, and, I mean, he's got, he's got some Christian sympathies, I think, but he's, he's certainly not a, 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 a Christian thinker. But I, I've been wondering why are so many uh, young, young men attracted to Jordan Peterson? My theory is, and this is just a, just a theory, is that Peterson is offering a, a model uh, that seems to be somewhat uh, virtuous and attractive. Because if you, here's the thing, if you live in an age where people are saying there is no one way to be male, okay, that, you know, that way of being male, if there's no one way of being male, you know what that means? It means being Harvey Weinstein is a legitimate option. Okay, if there's no proper way of being male, then Harvey Weinstein becomes an option. But here you have a guy like uh, Jordan Peterson says, no, there is a way to be male, to be, to be uh, virtuous, to be masculine. And, you know, you don't have to take any nonsense from the, you know, the ultra-feminist crowd or the politically correct crowd or the cultural Marxist crowd. But he says there are, there are actually right ways to behave. And there, are, there is a right way to live. So he, he's offering a type of pattern of masculinity. And I, I find that young men definitely crave role models. Someone, someone once told me, I, I don't know whether this is true, other people can tell me if it's true, that women like to listen to podcasts of women they can relate to. Men like to listen to podcasts of men they want to be like. Now that might be an overgeneralization, but we are we are. I mean, my, my fundamental point is, and this is what Paul underscores in Philippians, is the importance of imitation in Christian ethics, in the life of the church, in the life of ministry. It means you've got to find people to imitate, okay? People you, who are worthy of your imitation, and then finally, you have to be someone worthy of imitation, whether you're male or female, regardless of whether you're doing pastoral ministry, you're an academia, you're an advent, you're a mission, you have to be someone who is worthy of imitation. And I think Paul would say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So that in about, I think about 40 minutes, uh, is pretty much a summary of everything I learned about Philippians in this past year or so.